We live stream for this Good Friday celebration of our Lord's Passion here at St. Timothy's Aging Court. As a community walking the way of the cross this week, we now turn our hearts toward the Passion narrative and the solemn intercessions. In this sermon, there will be a homily that connects to our lives this day. Music will be woven throughout the liturgy and we will meditate on the cross on which the savior of the world was hung. For those joining us online today, the bulletin can be found on the website in the news section under Good Friday. Let us now just take a few moments to gather our thoughts and prayers before we begin this service. I invite you to stand. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And, and the, the Lord, Lord has, has laid, laid on, on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death, even, even death, death on the cross. cross. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray you of your mercy, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look graciously, we pray, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated for our first reading? A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, 
His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressor, transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Be Psalm 22 would be said responsively, and I will start with the first verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and a man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, if he will rescue him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me, strong bulls of nations surround me. They open wide their jaws at me like a ravening and roaring lion. My mouth is dried out like a pot sherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth and you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Me. 
They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him, stand in awe of him, O all of Israel. All of you will take the time to give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to the people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. Together let us pray. Father, you've tortured your son upon and cried out in anguish from the cross, yet you delivered him. He overcame the bounds of death and rose in triumph from the grave. Do not hide your face from those who cry out to you. Feed the hungry, strengthen the weak, and break the chains of the oppressed, that your people may rejoice in your saving deeds. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink, mingled with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They divided his garments among them by casting lots. They sat down and kept watch over him there. And 
but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Calpus and Mag Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, You do not fear God, since you are under, under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was, it was now, now the sixth, sixth hour, and, and there, there was darkness, darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. After this, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Then Jesus crying with a loud voice said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he, he breathed his last. And he bowed his head and, and gave, gave up his, his spirit. spirit. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from the top to the bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. Truly, this man was the Son of God. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance and saw these things. Since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from returning on the cross, from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they may be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke his legs, broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once they came out blood and water. He who saw it was, he who saw it was born witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not a bone of his shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. When it was evening, there was a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. A respected member of the council. A good and righteous man. Who also was a disciple of Jesus. 
and secretly for fear of the Jews. He took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate wondered if he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether Jesus was dead already. And when he learned that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had at first came to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about a hundred pounds weight. And he brought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud. And laid him in a rock-hewn tomb, where no one had ever yet been laid. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb, and departed. This is the passion of the Lord. speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's hard to believe that just last Sunday we were waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna! Last night, we ate with Jesus, and our feet were washed, and then we fell asleep while he prayed in the garden. Today, we gather together at the foot of the cross. It is Good Friday, and the hour has come. In seminary, I attended a few classes with a young woman who grew up worshiping in a number of different church traditions. Some of us wondered why she began studies in an Anglican seminary, and we asked her about it. She shared with us that she had been going to church since before she was born, and during the first half of her life went to churches that did not celebrate Good Friday. They celebrated only the resurrection on Easter Sunday. And she went on to say that there was still a service on the Friday before Easter Sunday, but it was almost exactly the same as the Easter Sunday service. In both the Friday and the Sunday services, the congregation would quickly acknowledge that Jesus had died, and then they would move to focus on celebrating the resurrection. Both services ended up feeling very much the same. And without realizing it, my classmate learned that this was how she was supposed to deal with the hard things in her own life too to acknowledge them briefly, and then quickly move to the resurrection, to the good news, to the silver lining. There's actually a fancy religious term for this. It's called spiritual bypassing. Spiritual bypassing is when a person uses spiritual language to avoid dealing with the hard stuff. It's a way of minimizing or distancing ourselves from the very real and difficult things in order to feel better in the short term. And it may provide some relief, but it doesn't make the problems go away. And it prevents us from doing the hard work that we need to do to actually deal with what's happening. It sounds very holy, but it isn't. It can somewhat, sometimes sound a little bit like this. 
Oh sure, my life is absolutely falling apart right now and I'm mired in grief that makes it almost impossible to breathe. But you know, everything happens, happens for a reason. God is good all the time, right? Or, oh sure, our trans and indigenous siblings live with the very real fear that they'll be killed just for being who God created them to be, but let's not talk about it. It's sad, it's depressing, it's frightening. Let's keep our focus on things that are positive. Each of these statements feel and look and sound like pretending every day is Easter Sunday. And that's what my classmate thought she was supposed to do. She did not allow herself to be a Good Friday person, even on Good Friday. The first time she went to a Good Friday service at an Anglican church, she couldn't believe what she was experiencing. The church was pretty bare. There were no flowers, no decorations. The congregation didn't hear the whole Easter story. And at the end of the service, Jesus had not risen from the dead. At the end of the service, Jesus was still dead. At that Good Friday liturgy, she was being asked to stay in the Good Friday part of the story. And the congregation itself was asked to leave the church in silence. They were asked to sit in that space of grief and loss and unknowing until they returned on Sunday morning. And my classmate absolutely loved this. It was one of the things that actually made her decide to join the Anglican Church, a church which is far from perfect. But she loved that the liturgy invited the congregation to acknowledge the whole range of human emotion and the entire story of Holy Week. She loved that there was a liturgy that gave her permission to sit in a hard place and didn't rescue her or force her to pretend that she was feeling victorious by the closing hymn. And this is what we are all invited to do today. There was no formal dismissal at the end of last night's Monday Thursday service following the stripping of the altar and there won't be one at the end of today's service either. There is no dismissal because all of our gatherings from Monday Thursday through Easter Sunday are considered one continuous liturgy that takes place over several days as we watch and we wait and we celebrate the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection. Our Thursday and Friday services end not with go in peace to love and serve the Lord, but with a to be continued. In a a stunning sermon by a number of years ago now from a, a preacher called Sarah Miles, she said she'd like to pretend that Good Friday, the murder of God by the people of God, is a one time historical event. That it took place far away in another country, safely in the past. That someone very different from me was responsible for the crucifixion. And Good Friday just means another day in a church with beautiful music. Crucifixion is always an act of terror. 
meant to carry a message to the entire population that the rulers of the world are all powerful and can crush anyone that they choose. In Jesus' time, the cross meant not just punishment for criminals and troublemakers, but shame for their families, who were forever marked by the scandal. The mere threat of death on the empire's cross led people to betray each other. It kept them in their places, separated and afraid to stand in solidarity. And it still does. Evoking our deepest fears of being cast out, mocked, hurt, or violently erased. Stigmatized by association with the wrong people. Today's forms of crucifixion leave us afraid to care for the imprisoned, afraid to challenge the violent, and they leave us too busy or guilty or helpless to even stand next to the families of the dead and weep with them. Fear can divide and separate us. And there is a lot of fear in the Good Friday story. But some people in this story act bravely despite their fear and the very real danger their actions put them in. The gospel writers tell us that Jesus was not alone when he was crucified. In addition to the various people responsible to ensure that the crucifixion was properly carried out like the centurion, there were other people who came to see what was happening. And John mentions some of these people, Jesus' mother, his aunt, the, the Marys, and the beloved disciple. And we know that no one was there to try and stop the crucifixion. That impulse had led Peter to pull out a sword in the garden. It doesn't seem to be anywhere in sight at the foot of the cross which probably meant that people were resigned to the fact that unless supernatural forces intervened, Jesus would suffer and die. And they would choose to be there when that happened. They can't change what is going to happen, but they're not going to ignore it either. They're not going to leave Jesus alone as he suffers and dies. Thankfully, I have never experienced the agonizing pain of death by crucifixion. But I have experienced pain. And in those times, I've needed people who weren't afraid to see me in pain. Who were willing to sit with me in that Good Friday space. I needed people who were willing to let me be in that Good Friday space for as long as I needed to be there. When I was preaching a few weeks ago, I mentioned a book to you called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies That I've Loved by Kate Bowler. She's actually from Winnipeg. And before writing the book, she found out that she had stage four cancer and it was likely she was going to die, leaving behind a young son and her husband. There was nothing she could do except choose to be with the people who would sit with her and not be afraid to talk about the hard stuff. Kate's story is actually an Easter story. She published that book, and she's still here among the living. But her experiences have really taught her how to stay present in Good Friday situations. Through her book, Kate teaches that when everything comes apart and we are in pain, we need people who are willing to stay with us 
in that pain and say one thing. Oh, sweetie, this is just so hard. And this is what the women who gathered at the foot of the cross are doing for Jesus. They are sitting with him in his pain, bearing witness. On this day, we claim the truth that this is all that we can do. This is all that we are called to do in this moment, to stay at the foot of the cross and bear witness to Christ's pain. And I hope that on this day and on all the Good Friday type days that we will experience in our own lives and in the lives of those that we love, that we will learn to embrace our discomfort and hold back on the temptation to make ourselves feel better by fixing or blaming or muting another person's pain. It's hard work. But there is healing power in correctly naming the terrible things as terrible things. Easter will come. There is hope. But today is Good Friday. And today we live into this place this deeply uncomfortable place that says that we can't pretend that we would have done differently than the chief priests or the crowd or Pilate. This place reminds us that we so often, out of our fear and out of our wounds and our wish to satisfy the crowd, prepare a cross for our own Savior. In a few moments, you'll be invited forward to lay a flower at the foot of the cross. The flowers are here at the front of the church, in front of the first pew. You might choose to gently touch the cross or to kneel at the communion rail and spend a moment in prayer with our Lord. And when we come to the end of the service and the silence comes, Don't be afraid to sit in this Good Friday space. You're invited, even as you go home and go about your day tomorrow, to sit in that Good Friday space. All the way through Holy Saturday, up to Easter morning on Sunday, when we come together to hear the rest of this powerful story. Amen. Thank you.
Holy God, your Son, Jesus Christ, carried our sins in his own body on the tree so that we might have life. May we and all who remember this day find new life in him now and in the world to come where he lives with you and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I invite you as you are able to be seated or kneel for the prayers. My dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Andrew, our bishop, and for all people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community and those about to be baptized, that the Lord will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by your spirit, the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in our vocation and ministry we may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for Charles, our king, and all the royal family, for Justin, the prime minister, and for the government of this country, for Doug, the premier of this province, and the members of the legislature, for Jennifer, the deputy mayor of this municipality, and Olivia Chow, the mayor, and those who serve with her on the city council, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, continue, continue, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution and prejudice for the sick, the wounded, the disabled, those living in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and the bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love. May God stir up in us the will and the patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, 
the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Hear the cry of those in misery and need. In their afflictions, show them your mercy and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for all who have not heard the words of salvation, for all who have lost their faith, for all whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of the Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up. Things which had grown old are being made new. And that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This is the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship.
And you've won my heart. And you've won my heart. Now I can trade these ashes in for beauty. And wear forgiveness like a crown.
Thank you.
As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Grant them pardon, bring them comfort, and may their faith grow stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.